Welcome to the Strategic Insights Podcast. I'm your moderator, Andrew Mackle. We have our, our partner and our practice for ETQ uh, conversation today. I'm very excited to bring on and have a great discussion with Tom Bedreau. He is our vice president of sales uh, and, our, and our direct contact with our ETQ practice. And also supporting the call today, I'm bringing in Tim Burke, who is our senior quality account executive an overall quality guru uh, due to his time in industry and his uh, different products he's worked with over the years. But uh, to kick off today's call, Tom, how are you doing today? Um, thank you for joining us. Doing well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Quality, really excited. Absolutely. I'm glad you uh, allowed us to pencil you in right after a vacation. Uh, I, I know coming off refreshed, you're probably excited to jump right back into a podcast. So I, I thank you for uh, prepping prior to your vacation and taking the time with us. Uh, of course, of course. Thanks. Happy to be here. Not, not a problem. So one thing I want to mention, uh, some people that know ETQ uh, in the space, they might have seen some possible changes in your logo. I wanted to let you know, say, hey, what's been going on with ETQ? What's new in the industry that we should probably let people know about? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, we were fortunate to be acquired by Hexagon AB, which is a uh, about a $4 billion uh, Swedish public company. They're a, a global leader in uh, autonomous manufacturing solutions. And uh, that acquisition took place actually in 2022. Uh, although we're seeing some of the, the changes to our branding now, we're now ETQ part of Hexagon. And uh, that's absolutely a sign that we are still operating fairly independently within a much larger parent. Um, you know, we're, we're keeping the ETQ name because it's a, a very revered name in the EQMS space. Um, yeah, so we're really excited to be part of Hexagon now. That's uh, it's great to hear. Uh, as you know, as a company that's gone through very similar things ourselves, uh, we always love the fact that when people um, understand the brand value and what you bring to the table, and then offer more funding, it's never a bad thing. So always good to hear that. Um, looking at uh, looking at the conversation today, I think it would be critical for us to talk about you know challenges currently uh, facing uh, the quality market in, in manufacturers. And, and I think it's uh, with the people we have on the call today or on the on the podcast today. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, get your thoughts on what you're seeing across the board, because obviously uh, ETQ being a flagship product that covers uh, a plethora of industries and being quality focused only, uh, I'd love to hear and get your background on what's the what's what are they currently facing now and what do those challenges look like? Sure. Um, you know, the people that we work with, the quality professionals, I, I don't think their job's ever been easy. Um, but it's getting harder and harder than ever before. And you might think, well, why is that? Right. Um, you know, first the regulatory burden on quality professionals is massive. You know, if you're a, a U.S. based manufacturer, for example, you've been subject to over five new regulations per week over the last five years, uh, which is crazy, right? Um, some big, some small, but, uh, that, that challenge is really increasing more regulatory burden. And then, you know, there's more competition than ever before, which is really driving companies to have to have a competitive advantage to win in their markets. So that's really, generally speaking, how do we produce higher quality products, but at lower cost than ever before because of that competition and, and, and pricing competition. Uh, you can add that just the products uh, and the companies that are making those products are becoming more complex, right? Um, just think about new technologies that are coming to the forefront and, and a competition, folks pushing each other to create more complex products to compete in a crowded market. Uh, and then, you know, if you're an OEM, for example, you don't just have to worry about uh, your quality or even your supplier's quality, but you also have to worry about your supplier's supplier's quality, right? That, that supply chain really uh, multiplies each other and, and creates a more pervasive issue. And then, you know, maybe last but not least is with over 3 billion people on social media today, if you happen to make a mistake in your in your manufacturing process and maybe you put a, a bad product out of the market, even a one-off, uh, people know about it and they know about it right away. So, you know, just in summary, more regulatory burden, more complexity, more competition, supply chain challenges that we all know exist and people talk and, and, and the word gets out there really quickly. So. You know, these you, you hit on it. Help. Yeah, you hit on it right in the head. I mean, let's be honest. When you look at uh, reviews for quality or any review in social media anymore, you're looking at nobody's giving good reviews unless that it feels like they're they're paid for or they're um, being coerced to do so. I mean, there's not as many people that have because we're all really busy, right? So to take the time to put in a good review, a lot of people just expect the quality. 
So what ends up happening is one bad review, um, and all of a sudden you don't have the offsetting you thousands of good reviews. Uh, it can be a, a slippery slope for, for manufacturers. And uh, yeah, it, it's not a pretty sight when those things start happening. I mean, I think you hit it on the head. You're, you're doing more with less and you're expecting higher quality and a better customer experience. So good luck, right? So I think, I think the focus needs to be on quality more now than ever. Uh, specifically on, on ma making sure that you don't have that one-off instance that could, you know, negatively impact your, your your sales for a quarter or a year or so on. I, I heard someone much smarter than me recently say that uh, one proven bad experience is is more than uh, a thousand proven great experiences in terms of the customer's eye. So what we're trying to do is uh, shrink that number down to as close to zero as possible. That's an awesome statement. Um, who did you hear that from, by the way? <laughs> I, I actually believe it was a Gartner report that was talking about uh, a CS in terms of especially social media. If someone were to, let's say, take a picture of a quality issue, that really sticks with people, right? Um, it does. Depending on how severe it is. I mean, let's, let's be honest. You can even go on Amazon and the first thing you do is if the review has a photo on it, you're looking at it, right? Right. And that, that, can be, that can be an interesting way to deal with business. So as we talk about that, what value can QMS systems uh, you know, bring to the market? Yeah. So, you know, in talking about just ROI, right? Um, first, it can help manufacturers reduce costs. So think about hard costs like scrap and rework um, is in the product life cycle, right? Uh, scrap rework, field failure costs or warranty costs. Um, it can uh, make your quality department and those departments supporting all areas of quality more productive, right? Uh, folks will spend less time on things like uh, managing non-conforming instances or uh, document revisions or even planning audits. Um, it can significantly help reduce risk, right? Um, by helping your organization remain audit ready. So think about a business that's even small, large businesses, it doesn't matter, but if you're growing at all and you're opening up new sites, for example, how do you ensure that your business is maintaining the same processes and procedures? Uh, uh, and even how do you ensure that you have consistent data flowing from one system to the next in order to stay audit ready, right? Um, and just follow the same work instructions. So uh, really helping reduce risk by uh, ensuring um, consistency across your quality organization. And then uh, we, we also help grow and protect revenue. And it's funny, um, I think some people at first glance, when, when we say that, they go, how is quality gonna impact revenue, right? But I'll tell you, first, we help grow revenue, uh, especially those that are taking advantage of our new product introduction uh, solutions. Uh, we help shrink the amount of time that it takes to get uh, a product from product design to the market uh, by streamlining uh, the quality procedures that take place throughout that that product life cycle and getting early feedback back to those who are designing and engineering the, uh, the product itself, right? And, and then uh, protecting revenues. I think this is probably one of the most important ones. And this stems back to positive and negative reviews here, right? Um, companies that put bad products out in the market lose revenues and they lose market share and they lose out on their share price because of negative feedback from customers. And you know, there is uh, another study that was done that said the number one determinant on where people spend their money is actually based on quality. And that is true both in the consumer world from groceries to baby strollers all the way up to cars. And then even in, in, the, in the commercial world, you know, where, where uh, um, businesses are spending a lot of money on, on uh, higher quality machines that go into the manufacturing process than another. And so, um, you know, if I were to summarize it, an EQMS can absolutely help reduce, you know, hard hard costs, soft costs, and time spent. Make your make your organization more productive. Uh, can certainly help mitigate risk um, in in maintaining your uh, certifications and making you audit ready, and help grow and protect revenues. You know, and, and I'm glad you highlighted those. Uh, 
because uh, I think that's the reason why we developed the ETQ practice uh, as strategic, because we found that we were running into customers where risk was popping up a lot of the times, and, as well as how did they scale, right? Because there, there's problems when they're rolling out, they're having an acquisition a growth model, and how do they get these new sites on the same uh, on the same quality solution? How are they tracking those metrics correctly? How are they keeping the quality level of quality up uh, to be able to support uh, new verticals and new ventures? And it it led us to you through, funny enough, Gartner study. Uh, and I think that's really where I wanted to bring Tim in today because Tim's got some experiences with our team and working with our ETQ uh, de- uh, delivery to support customers in solving those issues. So, Tim, I think you might even have a, a couple of proof points of some of the people that we worked with where you see value and what ETQ brings to the table to solve those those issues. Absolutely. Um, I've been in quality now for 30 plus years. I'm really passionate about comprehensive quality management systems integrated together. And as Tom said, you know, right now in quality, the stakes are higher than ever. Uh, you have to be quick to uh, market. You have to get it right. And he mentioned protecting customer revenue. Well, one of the value points that ETQ brings is it, it protects customer retention and it, per, it protects employee retention, both which cost if you don't get that right. And how does it, um, you know, for customer retention, yes, the feedback's out there and people are smarter, can see more data out there. But the other thing is, is customers just know. They know if, if a company's performing stably, consistently, and, and if they have a good system that will enable that, it will produce those results. And that's one thing. And then the other thing from the employee retention, if they can go to one software and it covers everything, it covers, you know, all parts of the quality, it covers safety, it covers environmental stuff, and it's all one interface that people are used to, and it's best in class, best in breed, they're using the best tools, they're going to feel empowered and like, you know, I'm part of an organization that's doing it right. Yeah, I, I will say that the, our clients that use the product are very much, uh, the feedback we're getting is, you know, uh, it feels like they're, they're given the tools to properly do their job and succeed. Uh, and the feedback that they're giving management, you know, allows them to have an open dialogue in, in the direction of what other future modules that we might implement as well to help them with, you know, future requirements. As Tom noted, the amount of requirements that come out are just staggering. And depending on what industry these customers are in, you know, that quality manager is sitting there pulling his hair out or he'll end up looking like me already <laughs> with all the things that he's going to have to be audit capable on by next year. And, and it's just amazing how well ETQ keeps up on those requirements. Yeah, uh, I wanted to add one more thing if I could. So like ETQ t- took the time to get things right. So like you talk to the, the people that are implementing it, they love like the master list, you know, the people that have to approve workflows all the time. They define those, and then those are the things that get right. Importing data from other systems to populate a system during the implementation, really important to get that right. So, so they've done a really good job on the little things that make the difference. You know, so we, we talk about customers that are, are, are getting the value uh, of ETU, but what, what does that customer look like? What's an ideal profile of a customer? Uh, for ETQ, uh, Tom, in, in your opinion? Yeah, no, g- good question. So I would say, um, when we start with, we've been in business for over 30 years. We serve over 14 different industries, which is fairly unique for an EQMS. I think the um, most of our competitors focus on one or two heavily regulated industries. And while we do focus on the most heavily regulated industries as well, like life sciences or food and bev, um, we have been, uh, we've kind of hung our hat on being a cross industry player. In other words, um, discrete process, electronics and appliances, chemicals, aerospace and defense, they all need quality. Right. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of acquired a wide variety of different industry based customers. And with that, we've built those best practices into our product over that long history. And so, um, you know, when someone asks what's their ideal customer profile, they expect us to say one or two industries. We don't because uh, we've been a cross industry player for a long, long time. And then from a a size perspective, you know, we've really helped customers up and down the quality maturity model, right? We've helped hundreds of customers move from a manual paper-based or Excel-based quality management system. We've also helped uh, those who have been leveraging an EQMS for a decade 
who now want to connect their QMS with, uh, you know, industry 4.0 solutions. And so, um, you know, one of our unique differentiators, and we'll get to this, is the configurabil configurability and flexibility of our, our platform. Um, and so that typically lends itself to being a favorite in the more complex uh, quality requirements. But with that being said, you know, we help small businesses every day uh, reduce the cost of their poor quality and help them achieve compliance at scale when the time is right. So my point is there's no industry that we can't handle. There's no size of business that's not a fit for us. Sure, we might be a favorite for a more complex business, but we help smaller businesses achieve their quality goals every single day. That's awesome. And especially if, I mean, if you're helping small businesses that, and we already know you do complex, it, it makes it for an easier phase if they have a, a pretty aggressive growth model. So good to note for those that have uh, large aspirations of growth and are looking at a quality sol solution for the first time. Um, looking at that, you know, we're, we're talking about when we, people look for quality solutions, uh, you know, who is it that really that generally reaches out and who should be part of that evaluation? I, I always struggle because we have a, we have a team that do sales and implementation and we require more people than I think are usually uh, asked for when we're in a, in a sales cycle. So when we get in there and I'm like, I need to talk to your quality manager. That's great. I also need your CFO to be part of this process because there's a, there's a cost of quality, right? There's a cost of not doing quality. And so when I always like to ask, you know, especially with you, Tom, leading, leading this part of the industry for ETQ, who's generally part of the evaluation process? Sure. Um, and I hope that we get to talk a little bit about buyer enablement uh, during this session today. But I, I also want to go back to another Gartner study that was done in 2019 that said uh, in today's B2B purchases decisions, especially in software, um, as of 2019, there were on average uh, 5.4 people uh, involved in a purchasing decision. And Gardner feels that that number is actually closer to nine to 12 today. And so uh, a lot of the education that we've had to do with quality professionals coming to ETQ with interest is uh, helping them identify who are the other stakeholders that typically need to be involved in a purchasing decision. Now, of course, this scales a little bit between, let's say, uh, a company that would be in uh, S&B space versus an enterprise space and the number of people that need to be involved. Um, but with that being said, it's never one, right? Uh, and so uh, the, the three personas that typically engage us first are typically someone in, in quality or quality assurance, right? And so this would be anywhere from a, a quality manager all the way up through a VP of quality. Um, the same titles would apply for supply chain or even IT that's serving on behalf of the business, right? Um, but at some point, typically those three personas are involved in an EQMS evaluation. Outside of that, you can't forget about those supporting the business, right? Um, we typically engage with, I already mentioned IT, but they're not always engaged first, but we always need someone from IT who can evaluate our, our solution and, and make sure that it fits into uh, a their strategic vision for the business, right? Is this solution scalable? Is it safe? Um, is it helping us with our digital transformation initiative? Um, we also work with folks in legal, of course, right? When it comes down to contracting and then depending on the size of the business, procurement is, is uh, likely involved. But then I would say uh, last but certainly not least is we are typically engaging with a senior financial buyer at some point in the sales cycle often a CFO, even, even up and down market uh, projects, um, you know, enterprise software solutions are typically going to the CFO's desk for an ultimate approval. And so, um, you know, recapping quality supply always involved. Uh, and then at some point somewhere, there's a senior financial buyer, like a CFO, um, as someone from legal and maybe even procurement. And I appreciate outlining the, the number of people in that because we find a lot of times that we start requiring or trying to help the customer and client understand what's going to be involved in this process. And, and we'll jump back to buyer enablement in a second. But when we talk about the impact of quality and the benefit of quality on an organization, a lot of times the initial um, the initial correspondence is someone being tasked to see what's out there for your industry or out there to cover a requirement. And it's generally a rabbit hole that ends up being a lot bigger than that because of not only um, the the value to the organization, but the the things that you can also take off their plate in other areas. Because a lot of times when they start looking at it, it might be a single 
uh, reason for for the the back and forth uh, response and looking at what's an available in industry. But it's almost like anything. If there's uh, water on the floor, the reasoning for the water on the floor, if you try, if you go upstream, is generally a lot larger than just one uh, one requirement or one industry requirement or standard. And so when you start peeling back that onion, you you generally find there's a lot more opportunity for the company to be better, to save money, to um, avoid risk. So it, it's good that you note that there's a lot more involved because a lot of times I get pushed back in the on those initial phone calls, and it's like, well, it's I have uh, my my manager of quality here. And I have one person from supply chain, and you're like, that that's a great start, but that's a start. So it's right. uh, it's 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 good that you highlighted those. So let's 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 drop back a little bit and let's talk about uh, buyer enablement a little bit. Sure. So, you know, with you you support us as well as a number of other ETQ uh, partners in the industry. You know, g- give us a little um, Tom's point of view for buyer enablement. In regards to uh, across, you know, your geo and, and what you're seeing, uh, I guess say best practices or, or supporting that 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 area. Absolutely. So, uh, buyer enablement at ETQ has been one of my, uh, I would say, best and most favorite projects in working at this company. Right? Is how do we help our quality champions evaluate at EQMS? Because uh, what we realize is our biggest competitor isn't another EQMS, it's no decision. And it's not because uh, the, bio, or the, uh, the quality professional that we're working with doesn't understand or perceive the value of the EQMS. They're often banging the table within their organization to try to bring it in because they know how badly they need it. You know, in going back to the Gartner study that I had cited before, where there's anywhere between let's call it five and all the way up to maybe even 12 people involved in a B2B purchasing decision today. What does that mean? It, it means that, uh, you know, the more people that get involved in a purchasing decision, the lower the likelihood that that business is actually going to do something about their underlying problem. The easiest way to describe this is think about uh, you and a handful of your friends trying to decide uh, where you want to go out to eat on a given night. It's a lot easier to work with two people than it is 12 people in order to build consensus around something. Why? Because everyone has a different opinion on how they want to solve the problem, right? And they also have different interests. So think about the stakeholders that I identified before. Someone in quality who works with someone in supply chain, they have two conflicting different values that they want to deliver for the business. They're tangential, but they're a little bit different. IT has their own initiatives and, and ideas of what they want to do for the business. Legal and procurement certainly have a uh, difference in opinion on how they want to, how they want to solve the problem. And so uh, the, the best thing to do that Gartner says is you can't just eliminate people from the decision process. That is not a good solution. But what they do say is we need to really equip buyers uh, with the right knowledge, with the right business case in order to help people build consensus within their own organizations around an idea because the better that you can help buyers build consensus around an idea and a project and a solution, the higher the likelihood that that business is actually going to do something. And so that problem gets even more challenging when it comes to quality, right? Because not every organization puts the same amount of stock in quality, right? And, And certainly senior decision makers can't always draw the direct line from uh, hey, us having an automated system, you really think it's going to have all that impact on something greater than this, right? And especially if you have those who say, we just need this because it's going to save you a bunch of time. That's not something that usually is going to get a CFO really excited about signing off on a project, right? And so, you know, our job, especially those who've never bought software before, is to help you with EQMS in the most efficient but thorough way possible, right? And so that includes things like uh, helping them with the decision criteria checklist. You know, what are the technical, what are the commercial, what are the vendor requirements that you're gonna want, who you're gonna wanna partner with? Um, It may even include, uh, uh, you know, snippet demos that you can share with folks internally to say, this is what I'm trying to achieve, right? This is what I'm trying to solve. Most importantly, it's helping build a very robust business case as to here's the underlying problem. 
it is having a pretty massive impact on the organization in either time, cost, risk, or revenue. We need to do something about it. Here are the options that we've considered. You know, it's do nothing. It's have IT go build us a solution, or we go partner with someone who's an expert in a solution like this. Oh, and here's who we picked and here's why. And here's the ROI that they're gonna help us achieve if we're to deliver this solution on time, right? And, uh, and that's absolutely something that we help quality professionals build today is that business case and the ROI. So not only they can put that on their CFO's desk, but when their CFO asks them questions and tries to poke holes in it, we prepared them to have that conversation and the likelihood that no decision happens has, has gone down, right? And the likelihood that that business rallies around or builds consensus around a, a solution has gone up. Absolutely. I, I think you highlighted a lot of great points there. And the one differentiator, I would say that working with quality solutions over my career, uh, ETQ is great in that empowerment Specifically, uh, there are ROI tools that you bring to the table that I think a lot of customer, a lot of different products kind of shy away from um, in, in giving people the, those items to be able to engage those different 11 people from different parts of the business and, and gain mm-hmm. that buy-in. So that, that was a great point. And not only that, the, the ROI tools that ETQ has are based on actual customer data. So they've carefully put together that to, to see what wins the customers are really getting and so it's very relevant to their to, to real customers, not just a generic ROI. Right, and Tim, I'd, I'd even add that we worked with a, a third party ROI expert consultant called Hobson and Company, and they interviewed two dozen of our customers to identify what was the common thread of value that they've realized after a few years of using Reliance. And so the calculator is entirely based on our customers' feedback and experience. And so the calculator even includes assumptions from those customers, basically the averages of averages of averages. And uh, we have applied uh, assumptions into our model that are oftentimes more conservative than the returns that our customers have experienced, because sometimes people say, I don't know how that's possible. Right. But, but what I can, uh, uh, you know, confidently say is that our, our ROI model is built on our customers experience. And we feel really confident in the returns that we demonstrate for uh, prospective customers. And that's the, that's that's different. And, and it, the money that you put and invested into that to be able to have that proof point, uh, I think is valuable. And uh, I know that we use it when we talk to customers. Because a lot of times, I always get the well, everybody has ROI tools. I'm like, well, is it a tool or is it data from you know uh, data from your customers based on what was provided by their solution? And little nuances on how we bring those tools and help that buyer enablement uh, are a big differentiator, uh, not just in the fact of uh, you know, selling the product, that, but the, the key differentiator in providing them with a solution that will bring the end goals that we have been touting as part of the, our dialogue with the customer uh, to fruition, right? This is actual data. These are going to happen. These are the things that you should look forward to and how we're going to accomplish you know, taking care of those underlying business problems. That's one thing I love about ETQ is they just get stuff right. <clears throat> For example, um, I was just talking to a, an IT person, and they, they said, yeah, the solution just seems to work on every single browser. You know, so ETQ being time-tested, it, it just, it's stable, it works, and they've, they've taken the time, just like with the ROI, to get every part of the application right, and that makes a difference. Absolutely. Um, you know, Tom, I think we, we've covered some good good topics today. You know, spe- specifically around buyer enablement. Um, you know, the underlying problems that you, you know you guys try to solve, which I think we can get into a little bit more. But knowing that we've got time out there, business challenges, uh, drivers. You know, your 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 industry experience and what what's brought to the table. Is there any areas that you want to make sure we we cover before we we wrap this call? Because our goal now is that we're this is our initial you know podcast, if you will, with ETQ and our of course our division that supports the product. But my goal is to set up a future podcast with a customer testimonial and, and bring you back on for a little Q&A and we can dive into that ROI and have, the, have a client actually be a use case as well. So I know you guys have the tools and you use, um, I think it's Hobson Company to pull that together for you. But I always like to uh, you know, end, with a, end with a couple of good notes and uh, set up a secondary time for us to circle back and prove out those things that we're talking about today 
and, and wrap it in a nice little bow. So when those people look at these podcasts in the future, they can go, oh, wow, not only did they discuss it and try to promote it, um, they, they showed me the full circle value of what they can bring to the table. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd probably like to leave you with two things, which is why do customers enjoy working with us? And then why do I get a lot of joy in my job and helping our customers, right? And I would say uh, from the fact of the feedback that I often get is, you know, beyond anything else, which is the ROI and the, the, the technology and all that stuff, it's customer experience. Um, you know, we hear from our customers that we deliver a supreme and superior customer experience, you know, from uh, the implementation, you know, with the folks that have been with our company for over 20 years that are helping deliver the solution for the customer to uh, our, our support team, who is uh, extremely responsive and helping uh, iron out any issues that the customers may be having, to our customer success team uh, that's focused on uh, maximizing the ROI of their quality investment. And then uh, we also have a, a really, really robust uh, online training program called Academy, where folks can go readily to learn more about our product, how to use it, uh, best practices, things of that nature. And so our customers are really, really happy with their customer experience. And that's why uh, we have an industry leading retention rate with our customers. Um, and then alternatively, you know, I guess on the flip side, you know, why do I enjoy working with our quality professionals? Um, First, I just enjoy solving problems, but I would say much more importantly, uh, we like to focus on our customer's customer, right? So we help some of the, the world's leading brands consistently make higher quality products and services. And when you go to companies like Varian, who's making you know radiation technology uh, to help folks with cancer, right? Um, We've even had some employees who have been recipients of said treatment. And it's like, it, it, it brings us a lot of pride to say that we may have had some small impact on the outcome of those products that are having a massive impact on our customer's customer, right? And so we, we like to think about, you know, we are <laughs> in some really small way uh, making a big impact well, with the work that we do. And that's what makes me happy to do it. That's awesome. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I'm looking forward to our next uh, our next dialogue, maybe doing a little customer testimonial and bringing those numbers into play and, and talking about um, their customer's customer uh, and, and why we're all we all do what we do. So, Tom, thank you for your time. Uh, looking forward to talking to you in the future. Uh, Tim, thank you for uh, coming on as well and talking about some of the customers that we help using ETQ. And I look forward to speaking to you in the future. Thank you.